Hello and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Andrew Sake and head up content for Minds and Money. Before we start, a couple of housekeeping comments. The webinar is scheduled to run for 45 minutes. All registrants will receive a copy of the recording of this webinar via email. And at any time, you can ask questions uh, by going to the questions tab in the GoToWebinar panel on your screen. If you experience any trouble with sound, we recommend that you exit the webinar and then log back in again. I'd now like to give a brief introduction to the topic and the webinar panelists. Today's webinar is called How Can the Industry Bridge the Logjam from Exploration to Development to Production? This is one of the keynote sessions at this year's Minds and Money London from the 25th to the 27th of November. And to debate some of these issues involved, we are joined by some of the speakers from that event. We're joined by James, we're joined by Jamie Strauss, CEO of Digby. Jamie is a former broker with over 30 years experience in the mining industry. Jamie is the founder and CEO of Digby, which he believes will disrupt and transform the due diligence experience of the mining sector. It will help mitigate risk, increase access, improve transparency, and create a stronger and better community. He also serves on the he also serves as an advisor on the Minds of Money London board. William Middlecoop is founder and chief investment officer of the Commodity Discovery Fund. Uh, Wilhelm has been an investor primarily in the junior mining uh, companies for over 10 years. He's one of the pioneers in discovery investing, whereby in a very early stage, investments in an exploration company are being made after the start of a significant discovery. Johnson Goodman is executive chairman of Dundee Corporation, one of the sponsors for Mines and Money London. Johnson has over 32 years of mining investments and operating experience. Over a distinguished career, he has built up extensive knowledge and relationships in the global mining and resource finance sector. He has worked as a geologist, senior analyst, portfolio manager, and senior executive, operating a mining company, leading a mining-focused investment banking group, and now delivering unparalleled insight and skill in his current role as executive chairman of Dundee Precious Metals. And Jan Bandari is a senior analyst for mining and minerals and, and institution investment consultant for Anarcho Capital. Jen is constantly traveling the world to look for investment opportunities, particularly in the natural resource sector. He advises institution investors about his funds. Earlier in his career, he worked for six years with US Global Investors, a boutique natural resource investment fund. A warm welcome to our four panelists. Thank you. I'd like to start off today's webinar by looking at some of the challenges at the exploration stage that lengthens the time to, to production and to profitability. So let's first of all look at some of those challenges and drill down at the exploration stage. It is, it is undeniable that it is, that, that it is becoming increasingly more difficult and slower to convert a discovery into a mine. Um, starting off with yourself, Wilhelm, what are the current rates between discovery and discoveries that become mines? Well, of course, if you look at, uh, let's say, 1,000 projects, um, you will only see one or two of them turn into a mine after one or two decades. But we have improved our, our selection model, and um, we have experienced 55 buyouts in the last 11 years. So uh, we have a one in three chance that um, a discovery made by a junior exploration company will be bought out after a few years by a major and then, uh, well, most of the times they will develop into a mine. So if, if you do your homework, you can, you can really uh, turn the odds. Uh, but on general, we have, um, um, well, we see a, a sector in crisis, one could say. It started with the great financial crisis after the collapse of Lehman. Um, that exploration budgets were cut, um, well, 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 well were lowered quite a bit and then we had a big um, correction in commodity markets after 2011 and then many uh, exploration budgets were scaled down so we haven't seen enough discoveries and uh, we're quite um, we're quite scared that in the next decade uh, we will see uh, some actual sh um, shortages in, in in metals markets we've seen a lot of stress in palladium markets already um, there's a lot of uh, well, there's a lot of uncertainty about nickel now. So um, I think the, the sector is in crisis, and 
um, we actually sh sh maybe should talk about a new way to finance uh, exploration uh, budgets. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so just kind of like building uh, on that, Jonathan. I mean, perhaps you can just build onto some of Wilhelm's comments as to why is getting a mining project through the exploration stage becoming more difficult? Is it the case that permitting and government red tape issues are getting worse? And perhaps you know, perhaps you can give us a point as to what you think some of the solutions are. Okay. Well, thank you, thank you, Andrew. Um, I'm going to try and build a little on what, Wil what Wilhelm said. Um, we are an industry in crisis, but I, I, I'm very low to say let's go blame the permitting around the world. Yeah, permitting is getting more challenging, but I, I don't think that's the real issue. I think the real issue is that we need to rebuild. Um, credibility in the mining industry. We don't have, I mean, we need to recognize you know, everybody's talking about, oh, when's the generalist investor coming back? Because we can't support all of our stocks with the investors that already invest in this sector. But we're not going to track the generalist investor with the industry track record that we have. And by track record, I'm not referring to whether you make money or lose money or someone buys you out or something like that. I'm referring to you know, people are putting out PEAs and feasibility studies and pre-feasibility studies that are just wrong. They can never build them to the specs that they're supposed to. They can never get the grade. They can't get the strip rate. Everything about them is wrong. And that's a huge credibility problem because what it means is you cannot trust the publicly available information. And if intelligent investors come to the conclusion that the information in the industry is not trustworthy, they're never going to show up to invest. And I, you know, the, the question I would ask everybody, if, if we did such a good job as an industry with information, how come every serious deal has involved signing a CA and involves major league technical due diligence? And the answer is because both sides of no, or the side, the, buy, the, the intelligent buyers know that you can't buy just based on publicly information, available information, because you can, we've all learned you can't trust that. And we've learned for good reason, because you can't. And so to me, we have to find a way to rebuild that credibility. And you know, the, other, the other question I would ask you, has anybody seen a feasibility study or pre-feasibility study that had a lower capital cost than a PEA? Mm. Or even a lower operating cost? I mean, the reality of it is they don't. Yeah, I, th I think there's definitely some very just interesting kind of uh, comments that I made there, uh, Jonathan. Um, John, I mean, I don't know if you have any sort of like remark to say about sort of Jonathan's comments about PEA and uh, PFS sort of studies. Um, I was always just partly sort of reminded as well by a slide I think I saw at PDAC earlier this year about saying that the gold mine discovery made between 1950 and 59 would have an 85% chance of becoming a mine, and today the figure is down to 23%. Is it the case that there are lower quality projects in 2019 than there were in, in 1959, or is there other factors that are, that are at play? In my view, Andrew, it is extremely difficult to have a, a very strong view on that subject. The reason is that um, we now produce more than three times more gold than we used to produce in 1950s. The gold mining uh, industrial structure has completely changed. The countries that used to produce gold uh, in a major way no longer produce gold in a major way. South Africa used to produce about 65 to 70 percent of the world's total gold in 1950s and 60s. Now it produces less than 5% of world's gold. Uh, also, technology has changed hugely over the last 60, 70 years. Investors have changed because of internet. Uh, retail investors have been able to invest in mining companies. So that has changed the way they incentivize the management. Uh, and also that has led to a lot of malinvestment. And that might be one of the reasons why we have, we might have more bad projects than we used to have earlier. Uh, but indeed, as uh, other people have mentioned in the past, uh, there is a likelihood that uh, uh, regulations have more become more difficult. The locals might have become more difficult in the sense that they 
probably want a larger piece of the pie uh, and environmental regulations certainly have become more difficult. Uh, but from my point of view and what I think should be the point of view of the management is that we shouldn't really be bothered about it. If environmental regulations have become more difficult, I should be financing these companies at a higher discount rate and I should be discounting them for more years than I would have done in 1950s. So as long as I still book my 20% profit expectation, which is what Wilhelm uh, constantly refers to, uh, I'm po personally perfectly fine. Mm. So bringing uh, Jamie into the conversation. And can, can I jump oh. in there? Andrew, can I jump yeah, in there sure, to add something? On. I also mm -hmm. think you got to recognize that geologically speaking, between 1950 and 2019, a lot of the low hanging fruit is gone. It's been mined already. So as you, as you move forward, it's always going to be harder moving forward. And in 50 years, we can have the same conversation and they're going to say, boy, they had it good in 2019. The reality of it is, is that you know, we got to keep going deeper and more creatively and using better techniques. But, you know, the, 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 the metals don't come from, uh, from above, they come from below and every time, every, you know, it's always going to be, be harder and it's never going to get easier. Thank you. Um, Jamie, um, bringing you into the conversation, why are preliminary economic assessments and pre-feasibility studies so inaccurate and what are potentially some of the solutions? Okay. Thank you, Andrew. And, um, I think a lot of this ties in with what Jonathan was saying, but I think what I'll just start off with is, I think there is, to some degree, we need to be better at respecting the parameters with which these reports are written to. Um, so obviously a PEA is plus or minus 25 to 50%, depending on who you talk to, PFS 15 to 25%. And these reports are written down to a confidence level of with which those parameters are set out. Now that does not answer the question with which you've raised, and I think Jonathan alluded to some of this in the beginning. Um, but we do need to make sure that we accept the relative context to which these studies uh, convey an effectively an appropriate risk uh, and opportunity uh, on, on how they're put together. But I think really, I think where you're trying to get to is, which really relates in my experience, is, is the rigor of these reports and how they're carried out. And I mean, if you look at the principal drive, going back to probably the early part of the 43101 and other uh, codes, is the principal focus other than regulatory of the owners of these reports has been driven to NPV and IRR. So they do the regulatory requirement, they get all the relevant data, which is good data, but then there's a lot of squeezing going on with consultants and everything to ultimately get a good marketing document out of it, which come down to two numbers, which are the inverse of each other. And that is a ridiculous position because there's a lot of good data, thousands of pages. I think there was one report, actually it was a Jork report that I'm aware of, was, which was 1,750 uh, pages. Even a PEA in Canada last year, I think it was at Cisco's Windfall Lake, ran to virtually 1,000 pages. So. And I think the other thing is, is these reports are being pushed through too quickly, or if they're not being pushed through too quickly, the results are, are to some extent skimmed. So the time pressure to, relief, to release these results, uh, these reports, leads to alternative scenarios. There's no one scenario in mining that is always going to be right. And, and I think the, the, the consultants need to look at multiple uh, scenarios to get up with the best risk mitigation. And I think these are being pushed through too quickly, which effectively means alternative scenarios are not being fully investigated. So what is the, what is the uh, solution? In my mind, the solution in simplicity is to bring peer reviews into the, into the process. Um, these are highly complex studies, which ultimately, uh, once they're written, they're being looked at an MPV and an IRR basis, um, and nobody is effectively uh, reviewing these as they would do in other complex industries, whether it's medical, biotech or whatever. So if you can bring uh, some type of peer reviews or some sort of other expert analysis into that, that would hold the industry to account. And ultimately, you would, uh, I think, uh, get better risk mitigation and therefore ultimately better results to come out of this. The status quo has got to change. We've got to focus on risk mitigation in this industry, not just upside, which is what I think uh, uh, a lot of people have been pulled into the industry for. 
Thank you for that. Um, I think that this probably leads on to our first poll of the webinar. So we'll just bring it on the screen now. And so I'd invite all the uh, participants to go and uh, cast their votes, which is about how accurate do you find PDAs and uh, PFSs. You've got five choices there. Uh, very accurate, quite accurate, not very accurate, poor, the whole system needs a rethink, and unsure. So we'll just leave it open for the next couple of minutes uh, whilst you go and cast your votes. Um, what we're asking the audience, perhaps I can ask Jamie to talk a little bit about Bigby and how you hope it can provide some of the answers to some of the challenges you raised in your last answer. Okay, well, thank you, Andrew. And to some extent, if one's going to make comments and criticism and constructive criticism, you've got to put your money where your mouth is. So Digby was founded with a concept about four years ago. It launched its freemium service, which is a, a really quite cool database uh, of all economic studies uh, since 2003. And you can find that on the digby.com. Um, and that's free for anybody to use. But where we're really going is how do we effectively change that status quo? Um, and ultimately, what we've done with Digby is we've put an expert network of uh, uh, mining professionals together, so geologists, metallurgists, and engineers, um, and also split that out uh, with accredited and non-accredited. Uh, we want to really uh, uh, drive the accreditation process within the industry under the existing guides, guidelines of any of those industries, uh, uh, those um, uh, bodies out there. Um, and we're going to get those experts to write at their own time and at their own cost uh, to our templates uh, based on those three key disciplines and objective and plain language, uh, a critical appraisal of the underlying study, whether it being 43101 or if we can get the Australians to publish their uh, JORC reports, then the JORC reports as well. And through that, once they've published that onto the Digby site, that will be available for anybody to buy. You can assume that these reports will cost on average two and a half thousand dollars. And what you get by that is you get a much fairer uh, analysis, a critical appraisal of both the opportunities as well as the risks in order to then debate and improve the risk mitigation of these studies and hopefully end up uh, with a uh, improved result when you finally get these uh, projects going through development and into production. Um, the benefit for the experts is they get 50% of the income um, and the benefit for the, for the users uh, is immediate uh, uh, and much lower cost and uh, immediate and much lower cost uh, due diligence available, um, which, uh, which, which I think is gonna transform this industry, frankly. So I think we're just now, uh, so thank you very much for that, Jamie. We'll now bring up the answer for the uh, first poll. So thank you for everyone who sent in your vote. So 7% said very accurate, 7% quite accurate, 14% uh, of you were unsure, but 21% said poor, the whole system needs a rethink, and 50% said not very accurate. Um, one sort of resonating with uh, some of the comments that have been made earlier. So let's uh, move on to the next, uh, so let's move on to the next part of the uh, webinar, talking about improving the due diligence process. Um, Perhaps sort of uh, concern to yourself first, Jonathan, how can we get greater use and value out of uh, mining economic studies? Um, well, normally I would answer firewood, um, but uh, the, the truth of it is is that uh, um, I, I, I like the, uh, the comment made uh, before about uh, a peer review. We've done a lot of thinking about, uh, about that because in, in larger and intermediate companies, you do have um, a peer review, but in these smaller companies, um, what's happened is these economic studies have become uh, mostly about marketing tools, and they're trying to, you know, get a high NPV. When the reality of it is, is that uh, these these studies are supposed to be viability studies. You're supposed to put conservative assumptions in, and you know, knowing that you can do better, and that that's not, you know, these things were never meant to be valuation studies and they've turned into that and it's a it's, it's a dangerous thing because there's, there's a lot of demand for capital and this puts a lot of pressure on these engineers to kind of put out the best case scenario which is what a lot of these studies have become um, so I think you know one is a peer review two is a strong board um, with governance and maybe the peer review should fall under the governance 
uh, side, side, side of the board. And three is, you know, is, 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 as was alluded to, is get more information out there. You know, when, when, when someone puts out a, a resource, you know, my personal assumption is everything that went into making that resource should be in the public domain. You should have the ability to understand that the, what the wireframes are and how that resource was determined and whether or not the geological model underlying everything, which is, um, makes any sense or not. How much, you know, so I, I think that uh, we need to do a proper rethink. We need to actually get, certainly get peer review into it. And, but we also need to actually find a way for boards to take on a greater role of, on the governance side to make sure that these are not just um, marketing documents to attract capital, but actually realistic um, scenarios that are still going to attract capital, but attract the right type of capital at the right time. I think people are too um, too focused on trying to build a mine too quickly and not trying to um, really understand what the true risk and reward of a project is. Andrew, you. just before you go on, can I just make one comment to to, sure. to Jonathan's comments there? Mm. Um, the one of the interesting things about these reports is nobody, I think, seems to disagree that the underlying data in these reports is, is actually quite valuable. The problem is, is the end result of these reports. And I think it's a, a good way to describe this is the funnel. I mean, everyone's looking at what's coming out of this funnel, which is the NPV and the IRR. But imagine the 400 or the 4,000 bits of detailed information that goes in into that funnel. And if you compound the positive, if, if, if consultants are being squeezed to use the positive side of the scale for a number of these key uh, assumptions going into the top of the funnel, then the compounding effect at the bottom of the funnel is huge. And that's the area that we need to better understand and better get access to. And, and, and I agree entirely with Jonathan to get all of the data out there, uh, rather than just the select bits and pieces which meet regulatory requirements. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, uh, Jamie. Um, bringing Jan back into the conversation, when you're looking at these feasibility reports in the critical components, how do you assess geology, metallurgy, and engineering? Was that for me, Andrew? Yes, it was. Sorry, Jan. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, of course, these are all important uh, aspects of, of the studies. And um, uh, well, I must say that for us, uh, the PEA and PFS are important parts uh, in the due diligence process. And once you know that you uh, have to take them with, some, with a little grain of salt, uh, a lot of information can be found there. So I, I, I'm not too negative on that side. I'm, actually, I, I, I'm more negative on um, a subject we haven't touched upon, and that's the crisis in this industry is also because of the... Uh, well, all the, all the, well, one could say all the scams being set up and used and being facilitated by the Canadian broker system. And, and I think that's, that's a, an even bigger part of, uh, of, of the crisis in the exploration sector. You know, um, the average uh, investor in Canada has been, um, has been played for so long that it, it's not strange that they, they don't put their money into this, um, this casino anymore. Is the, um, in your opinion, oh, Wilhelm, is this the situation in Canada becoming sort of better or, or, or is it sort of like just as bad as it was 10, 15 <laughs> years ago? Uh, well, maybe it's better than pre brex <laughs> but I haven't <laughs> seen any change uh, on, the, on the good side in the last uh, decade. And of course, we, we work from the Netherlands, we work from Europe, we have very strong regulators here. And all the games being played in Canada, you know, they, they, these games can never can never happen on, on, on European stock exchanges. The the regulators are asleep at the wheel, and everybody is, is almost like proud of being trading on on insider knowledge. It's 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 horrible. Mm -hmm. James, can I comment on that? Because I'm actually I'm actually You're in easy. Canada. Mm -hmm. You know, I just want to say, I feel like I'm just listening, listening to the South Park episode, Blame Canada. Um, I'd, I'd <laughs> like to hear more of the specifics of the games that you're talking about, because I do, I do agree that the industry itself um, overly exaggerates 
uh, their numbers and there's a lot of pressure and demand for capital. But, you know, I, I, I think Canada has a, a pretty tough regulatory system. So I, I'd love to hear more about what the games are. Well, come, come and visit Europe and then you will see how regulators uh, are acting and, and need to act. And the, the amount of insider tra trading is unbelievable. Actually, I've said this before in interviews, we're always on the hunt for the next big discovery. And the first thing I do when I see a discovery hall, a press release about a discovery hall, the first thing I do is to, to take the graph and to look at the graph of the company. And when it hasn't been.